Today, I'm here with Dave Rapps, who's a very good friend of mine. We've known each other for a number of years now. Uh, first met through EO, I believe, but we've known That's each other right. for a while before that. Welcome. So Dave is the CEO of Carbon Click, and according to the website, uh, they connect businesses and individuals to projects that fight climate change. So Dave, would you mind explaining a bit more about what that really means? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and I apologise for my cracky voice today. Too much partying, eh? <laughs> uh, I've been yelling at the kids all day yesterday trying to teach them sailing. Um, so, yeah, Carbon Click is about helping to power up a business or an individual's sustainability goals through offsetting what they can't reduce. And, and what that means is, you know, you've got a carbon footprint. We've all got a carbon footprint and we've got this massive problem in the world that our carbon footprint far exceeds the planet's capability to deal with it and it's spiralling out of control. Mm -hmm. it's, Climate change is one of many uh, negative impacts from that. So <clears throat> we all need to reduce our carbon footprint. Yep. But there is only so much technology and only so many options at the moment that allow us to move quick enough. But what we can do is we can offset the balance. Mm -hmm. And that's what where Carbon Click stick, uh, steps in is for individuals, you can offset uh, the carbon footprint of your life. And for businesses, they can either offset um, their products or the residual footprint of their products so they're carbon neutral or carbon offset. And for businesses wanting to offer this to their uh, customers, they can also uh, implement an option where the customer can click to offset while they're purchasing something. Yep. The classic example everybody knows is with the airlines. airlines. You go and book yep. your flight or you might remember booking your flight. <laughs> it seems like such a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. we're all desperate to explore the world again and reconnect with friends overseas. Yeah. It's, it's a tough time. But when you do get that opportunity again to book your flights, you'll you'll notice the carbon offset button or tick box on, on a lot of airlines. Yeah. And, and if I'm right, because, I mean, that was where you originally headed, right? <clears throat> when we were was going through the incubator, that was what the home business model was. And, of course, um, you were really only just starting to take off and COVID hit. So how was 2020 for you and what did that mean for your business? Yeah, 2020 was was just as rough uh, for us as it was for many. We, You know, we were looking for the noose and trying to figure out, you know, whether there was a way through this at all. Yeah. Um, what, what we tried was the next part of our business plan, which we'd always anticipated scaling into the wider e-commerce space. So um, we'd gone from having our airlines and airports that, that we had already signed up um, who cancelled those contracts. Yeah. We'd, we'd gone from uh, that to um, setting up the business to trade e-commerce. So when you're buying your handbag online or whatever it is that you're buying or your pair of Allbirds, um, you can uh, immediately just click a button or click um, a tick box to offset um, the emissions of that product. Or even if you don't know the emissions of that product, you know that we've got a problem that's big and it gives you an opportunity to do something about it. And the big thing that Carbon Click has changed is the trust and transparency of carbon offsetting. So in the past, especially with airlines, um, people had lost uh, lost a lot of trust that that money actually went to a good mm -hmm. place. So does it actually result in trees being planted or protected? Yep. Um, does it actually result in positive change for the climate? And they just they just don't trust the airlines uh, or the or any business enough to know that it's just not another uh, money making scheme or helping them to comply. Yep. So tick box. Yeah, or a tick box exercise. Yeah. So what we do is we actually provide a track and trace receipt, just like a track and trace on a courier, which shows you exactly where your, it might be $2, has gone, yeah. um, right down to the carbon certificates on the government uh, registries, like the Emissions mm -hmm. Trading Scheme uh, Registry for New Zealand. Yep. Yeah. That's come a long way since I saw it in the incubator. That's awesome. So I yeah. understand you, yeah, so it started off as a, a pretty, let's say, shit year, um, turned itself around. You've had a good year coming out of that. Obviously, e-commerce has been booming. You've got 15 staff now, is that right? Or 15 yeah. locally? Or Yeah, we've got uh, 12 in New Zealand okay. and three overseas. Yep. 
Awesome. Oh, and, and a lot of that is research and development still because we need to, like with any uh, tech startup, we need to continually um, stay well ahead of the curve um, as we're scaling. Yeah, fair enough. Now, I know that you're really passionate about sustainability, but that's not your only business, right? So you've got other businesses that you currently own. And am I right in saying you've had 12 businesses over the last 20 years? Yeah, that's right. Um, most of them I have, you know, maybe for three years or so enough to get in there, learn learn an industry and and conquer a challenge yep. um, and and then exit again and be able to take a bit of time out. But but some of them have, have been longer periods. Some of them have been uh, much shorter periods. Sure. So what's your proudest moment throughout all that? Through, throughout all that probably was a – um, in business, a 25-year-old company that we bought a bricks and mortar engineering business, uh, New Zealand-based, and um, that was a bit of a management buyout where I was called in as an external party. Mm-hmm. I'd done some um, auditing and background work for that company in the past uh, just to help them out, and so I was a little bit familiar with the back-end processes behind it. So we were able to get in and restructure that business for uh, triple bottom line profitability. <clears throat> so, explain that? I mean, yeah, I understand a yeah, little bit yeah, of what sorry, it means, but for I, the people who are listening in, what do you mean by triple? Yeah, so, so what we look for with triple bottom line profitability is they've got to be sustainable financially. Yep. They've got to be sustainable from a social uh, perspective. Yep and together known as socioeconomic responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is environmental um, sustainability. So is it a circular economy business or are are you having a net deficit effect on the planet? And if you are, what are you doing to make up the balance? Because, you know, our kids and their kids uh, will run out of land and landfills uh, at some point in time. These are issues we have to address. So when I look at a business, I look at the opportunities for that business to turn it into a more sustainable uh, business all around. Um, I wouldn't do it if I couldn't get better social outcomes, environmental outcomes and um, financial outcomes. All three have to tick the box. Fantastic. Okay, and I know on a personal level, you know, this sustainability is, is a big passion of yours and you were involved in sea cleaners. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So this was um, coming out of, you know, my passion for the environment. I, I grew up out in the bush. I saw that. Um, you know, we, we we didn't have glad wrap on our sandwiches or anything like that. Uh, in fact, we're lucky if we had shoes to go to school. With. <laughs> Not, and you walked 10 miles in the snow. No, I, it was, no, it was none of that. It was just our parents couldn't force us to wear them. You know, no, okay. we, we just preferred bare feet. We're just, yeah. you know, we, we loved it. Yeah. And then we moved closer to town and and I started to see, you know, less sustainable ways. And, and, you know, if we had rubbish in the bush, we didn't have a regular rubbish collection. You know, we had to take it somewhere and yep. deal with it. So you were very cognizant of making sure that you didn't create much rubbish um, because it was another hassle. Here it's just so easy mm. because it, it doesn't matter. You don't think about it. Everything just goes into a bin and yeah. disappears. And, and because it disappears out of sight, out of mind, you don't know that it's a problem. Yeah. Um, but Sea Cleaners was one of those opportunities to educate on single-use plastics. <clears throat> it also came from my love of diving and fishing and spending time on the water. Mm-hmm. And in New Zealand, increasingly, I was seeing, you know, as I'm swimming, I'm seeing plastic things floating past me and straws and simple things. Yeah. Um, plastic bags were terrible. And, and you know, I was reading stories from Kelly Tarleton's and other uh, marine biologists about the number of turtles that were dwindling in population. And generally speaking, it's because they're eating plastic bags because jellyfish is a big part of their diet. Right. Yeah. So Sea Cleaners was really um, founded to educate and try and arrest, be the ambulance at the top of the cliff, mm-hmm. but having impact by being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. So we took um, groups of corporates and school kids um, out to uh, islands, or coastlines around New Zealand uh, to begin with um, to actually do the cleanup. So we used the wind and the and the tides as our net, you know, and 
at a high tide, all the plastics get deposited. Yep. Um, and then when the sea breeze comes in the late afternoons and the tide changes, that carries back across the harbour again. So so you're able to predict where the rubbish build-ups will be. You can collect it before it passes back through the harbour again. Yep. It's quite an efficient way of doing it. And and that education really sinks in when you're giving the talks and then people are actually <laughs> seeing, yeah. you know, we've seen Kiwi skeletons with party balloons in there. Mm. Uh, ingested. Yeah. So they've obviously thought that balloon just looks like a, um, a worm or something. I don't know what the Kiwi thinks, but yeah. all, all we do know is that all of those plastics that we just take for granted have an impact sometime downstream. And, and that was the idea is, um, is to prevent more of that impact. Mm -hmm. And and we quickly got good corporate sponsorship and local government sponsorship to expand. In fact, um, right now, Sea Cleaners is uh, doing all of the America's Cup. Um, I actually saw a truck out on Sunday. I was out walking the dogs, and it <clears> reminded me of you. But you're not involved in that anymore, now, are you? No, I had to. Um, I had to pull back uh, in the middle of last year because uh, mainly because Carbon Click had grown so much faster, and with COVID happening, mm. there was so much change going on that I just needed to be fully committed with all hands on deck with Carbon Click. Yeah. It, we're talking 80 hour weeks for probably nine months. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't have the bandwidth to carry on with it. And it broke my heart having to, you know, leave it after building, you know, with others, yep. building it up to such a good position. But um, we've got to pick our battles, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was all hands to deck when <clears throat> COVID hit, that's for sure. Yeah. Hey, so I wanted to ask you, so you've had these, these varying businesses and your sort of modus operandi is to go in there and look about how you can, um, you know, make the business more profitable while still maintaining sustainability and the other important things. A lot of people think that um, introducing sustainability comes with a cost and therefore it's going to erode your profits. Can you tell me how you approach these businesses and what you do to you know to focus them and, and what effect that has yeah i mean it's it does come at a cost but that cost is like any cost of improving a business you know if if you want a, a new machine that operates twice as fast and uses half the fuel it's going to cost you money mm -hmm. it's all an investment um and those investments might pay off or they might be for the right reason um for me it was a non-negotiable that we have to be a sustainable operator and that's about standards more than uh, investments yep. <clears throat> but in saying that more often than not um, if, if you take a big picture approach all of the sustainability efforts that we've put into a business have resulted in helping to make that business um, give it a social license to operate um, give it a better exit opportunity because you're ticking a lot more boxes for investors and investors these days uh, and directors they want to see sustainability as a as an important part of their portfolio too yeah. um and it, the financial returns normally come from uh over time improving your brand image yeah. and if you've got a better brand image that might be what gets you a, a client yeah. over your competitor who just doesn't care about this or is not far enough on the journey yet yeah. so from from my perspective yeah I could have potentially made a little bit more money if I'd not cared about it but I certainly made plenty um, by doing the right thing. Sure. And I mean, you've taken a lot of businesses that have been very reliant on the business owner and then worked with that to remove that reliance on the, on the business owner. First of all, why is that important? And <clears> secondly, <throat> what does that do to the business in terms of value at the end of the day? Yeah. So, I mean, probably the majority of businesses in, in New Zealand, at least, and globally, have been founded by a good idea and a great person and they've brought another partner or another team or maybe it's a husband and wife to to build this business. Yep. And that business is their nest egg, it's their retirement plan, it's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. They never, ever anticipate selling that business. Then something happens or they have a heart attack or something, you know, yep. they realise... Life's too but short. Life's, life's short and they've built more like a jail around them <laughs> and they can't get out because every system and process, because they're so clever usually, yeah. they're able to plug holes much easier than training somebody else or fixing a process uh, which takes far longer. Um, or building the process. I can relate, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's so much easier just to plug the hole yourself yep. and keep going. And eventually you run out of fingers and toes and think, crikey, we're, we're still growing and there's more holes appearing. 
Um, and because there's more holes appearing, all I'm going to do is take my finger out of that hole and put it into this hole. And, and you start to lose scalability and hit your glass ceiling. Yeah. And a lot of businesses that I've looked at that I've um, wanted to purchase have been in that situation where they've plateaued on growth yep. uh, and plateaued on profitability because of the business owner. So then the business owner decides one day they want to sell. <laughs> And or maybe they have a marriage breakup and they have to sell or something. Mm-hmm. Circumstances change. That's that's one thing we know for sure. Yep. And because there's been no planning for an exit and the business is not ever going to be exit ready in their current business model, they have to sell the business for market value, which is significantly lower than what it could be worth if they'd just got those systems and processes sorted out so that the business didn't rely on them as a business owner. Yeah. And and often I've gone into businesses where they've gone into a lost territory without the business owner because they've um, had an epiphany or, uh, you know, found love and just gone overseas and let the business come crashing down or for whatever reason they've had to yeah. duck out of the business or decided to. Um, and, and that business is now making a loss and potentially worth next to nothing. Perfectly good business. And that's they've before that time, they've spent years building this thing up and they've wasted all of that energy for very little returns. Business owners usually earn very, very little minimum wage. Yeah, minimum wage if you're lucky sometimes. Yeah. Um, I know I've been there. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) and uh, so all of that effort, you don't want it to be for nothing. You want to try and have your business ready to be able to uh, capitalize at any point in time that you need to. Mm-hmm. So that's all about letting go, isn't it? You're about mm-hmm. hitting the ceiling, and really the only way to get past that hitting the ceiling, and it happens to us all at different levels individual, departmental, organizational. Um, the only way you can really move past that and keep growing as opposed to just completely plateauing or worse still failing yeah. is to actually learn how to let go. How do you? How do you do that? Because it's that's, tough, right? That's a, it's a really hard one. It's like, yep. you know, letting your baby go <laughs> or whatever. Parents can probably relate <laughs> yep. uh, when you're leaving a baby with a babysitter or sending them away on holiday or whatever. Yep. Um, it's it's just something that you, you have to do. You have to be able to separate yourself from the business. You are not the business. Um, but if you are the business, um, it's, it's not a business. It's a job, sure. right? Yep. Um, so what would be the kind of the steps that you would talk to people about taking in terms of, you know, making sure the business isn't built around them? Generally speaking, you, you need to be able to prove resilience through uh, making sure that I, I would test it on a small scale first. Yep. Reduce your hours to four day work week and, and all those kind of things um, and see how the business fares, see where the cracks are. But it's it's really getting external eyes on the business as far as systems and processes, which is really important. Yep. So uh, having an independent director, having um, a good mentor to be able to map out uh, systems and processes um, and, and down to a detailed level, depending on the size of the business for larger businesses, for example, we'd, we'd put in place um, uh, in the manufacturing business, 25-year-old engineering company, Um, we ran our heads of uh, engineering through lean manufacturing courses so that they could um, learn the end-to-end processes, learn where they were creating waste, learn where they could improve profitability and turnaround of of everything that they were doing instead of a business owner having to come and point out on the same things on a daily kind of basis. So depending how big you are, getting those systems and processes mapped out and an independent person to uh, help you with that is is probably the first and most important step I would take. And then empowering your staff to actually recognise continuous improvement cycles around that and in, and incentivising your staff to do so. I was going to say, we're chatting about this before we actually came on the podcast. You said that often businesses don't incentivize, incentivize around the end goal. And so you might be incentivized for productivity where in actual fact the business is looking for something different than that. So can you give me an example of yeah how yeah. you're incentivized to get best results? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So um, I've been in businesses where they've had, you know, they've produced something or had a service and they've sold something. So they've got sales teams and they've got teams that do the work. Um, Those teams that do the work don't have any incentive against their pay um, for 
producing more. Yep. So they've got nothing to strive for. They've got no ongoing training to help them achieve higher targets. Um, you really want them to be able to better themselves as a result of working for you. Then, you know, they're not just a machine. They've, they've got to advance. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to get that in place. It's same with sales people. I've been in organisations where there's no commission or financial reward in their pay that directly attributes to better quality sales yeah. and and better sales volumes. Mm -hmm. So it's just making sure that all of those, the KPIs are all aligned to the business goals um, for the right people. And often there's a team KPI component as well missing where if the business does better, everybody does, you know, has a bonus attached to that. So I've generally gone in with a package approach. Yep. Because um, they've all got to be on the same page first of <clears> all, don't they? If a company doesn't, if everybody in the company doesn't know what is going on and where we're headed, how do they work towards getting there? So I suppose. Yeah, the, the arrows have all got to be pointing in the same direction. Yep. Um, and from, from the employment contracts right through to the staff motivational talks, through to the sharing the you know, business strategy at an annual at least basis yep. um, and working down to management teams, depending on the size of the business, to make sure that their teams are also empowered in the same way. Mm -hmm. So the, the best way to get them to listen is to get them to teach. Yeah. Um, Great and, point, yeah. And that's that seems to have worked really well uh, from my experience. Fantastic. Okay. So if we gave the, the listeners um, three points they could walk away with here today in terms of what they can start to do at least to get on that journey of your triple bottom line <clears throat> and profitability, what would that be? Yeah. So, so the most important thing there is team, team alignment yep. uh, by far and large, making sure all those arrows are pointing in the right direction. So um, have a good HR person review and potentially help you to restructure um, if people are set in their ways, you might have to cut the umbilical cord, you know. Tony uh, talked about that a few weeks ago, yeah. Sometimes you've got to let those people go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the best thing for them, a fresh start, mm -hmm. and uh, and the best thing for your business to bring some fresh life in. Yeah. Um, We're all on the same page, right people, right seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Incentivising to achieve the results. Yep. That's that's right. So uh, sorting out that team alignment, okay. um, number one, in incentivization. Right. Number two would be bringing an independent view. Yep. <clears throat> so why do you say that? Because you mentioned that earlier. What do you? Why? Why is it independent? Be, because view? we all have a rose-tainted view of our own um, theories. Yes. So it's like when you Google something, right? Yeah, you actually you look for the answers that you want to read, not the ones. I'm only going to pay attention, really, yeah. to the data that supports our theory yes. because we always yeah. want to be right. That's a human <laughs> nature. Yes. Um, yeah. Whether we're proving it to ourselves or anybody else, yeah. um, to the detriment of the business. So what you need is somebody independent to see, you know, you need to be taking independent surveys um, and that sort of thing, which is the third thing I'll talk about. But yep. you need somebody independent that can look at the data, look at your market validation and see whether that makes sense against your strategy and focus. Sure. So that would be the second thing, independent director or business mentor that can help you uh, see the uh, see the data for what it is. Yeah, I like that <clears> idea, <throat> of course. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the third thing is um, having the voice of the customer. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you're listening um, because that's where opportunities come from. Improvement opportunities, new opportunities. Um, and so that's that can be as simple as net promoter scores or it can be as complex as customer interviews. Yeah. Um, but you want to make sure that you really understand why your customers are buying from you, what your customers um, want from you, and yeah. and whether there's a, a a gap in expectations that leaves you exposed to a, a competitor coming in and doing a better job. Yeah, fantastic. And I suppose finally, just in terms of sustainability, what would be the one sort of key tip around building a sustainable business? What are the things that you've learnt in your 12 businesses? Yeah, so from a sustainability perspective, again, getting a, a quick a quick and dirty, I call it, um, independent audit yep. from a sustainability consultant. Um, it can cost very little and give you a few ideas which you can prioritise where your, your biggest opportunities to improve are yep. and, and start with those. But there are lots of um, eliminating wastage is probably um, – 
the best results I've had out of out of all businesses. Um, cutting back that wastage, automating systems and processes so that you you know your lights aren't on where they don't need to be. Yep. Um, if I use that as an analogy for for all processes in the business. Yeah place to start fantastic hey look always a pleasure to have you on here if people are interested in carbon click and think it might be for their business how would they get in contact with you um you can just inquire um, there's a chat on the website carbonclick.com um you can connect with um any of our team on linkedin uh, just look up carbon click we're all there so you can go straight to the right person um similarly on the website we're all first name basis at carbonclick.com excellent um yeah we, we have a policy of not employing two people with the same name <laughs> <laughs> okay no more dave's then right got it <laughs> no. No. Right. hey dave look as always i love i love chatting to you i could talk for hours but we don't have hours unfortunately but i appreciate you coming on sharing your experience and we'll look forward to seeing you again thanks deborah thanks very much cheers